Until tonight, for the first time ever, Texas Governor Greg Abbott takes your questions in a live town hall. He'll be in the hot seat in Tyler as he answers tough questions directly from you, the voters, just days after the horrible events in El Paso. You want to hear from him. How could the shooting in El Paso happen? You want to hear what will be done about illegal immigration. You want to hear if the Democrats really are gaining ground in Texas. And you want to hear if those pesky property taxes are going to continue to go up. Listen tonight to these questions and the governor's answers as your fellow Texans have a one-of-a-kind chance to talk directly to their leaders. Welcome to our live town hall meeting with Texas Governor Greg Abbott. Hi folks and good evening. I'm Neil Barton, KTK News in Tyler, Texas. I'm Sally Atmondas. I'm the morning anchor at KXAN in Austin. And we are live on the campus at the Cowan Center here at UT Tyler. Yes, we are. Thank you for coming tonight. So Governor, you were talking to the crowd a couple of moments ago, but now we're live on television across the state. Before we start tonight, anything you'd like to say? Real quickly, I want to say uh, thank you to the University of Texas Tyler for hosting this fabulous event. And thanks to NextStar for broadcasting this event across the entire state of Texas. There you go. Just real quick, I, I want to say that it's an honor to be back in East Texas. As many people know, I uh, grew up as a kid in Longview, Texas, and so it's great to be back in East Texas and Town of Texas. But very importantly, I want you to know this. Even though I'm in Tyler tonight, my heart is still in El Paso. I was in El Paso last night for a memorial in the aftermath of the shootings that took place. And it's gut-wrenching. And I want the people of El Paso to know my heart remains with you and our work to help you is just beginning. We're going to touch on El Paso in just the next few minutes, Governor. I also want to introduce KXAN political reporter. This is Phil Prazen over here. He's going to be in the crowd. He's going to be presenting some questions that we have and hopefully get some answers on that as well. And one more piece of housekeeping tonight across the Next Star platform. We have television stations across the state, and one in Shreveport, Louisiana, and our partnering stations in the city of Houston and Dallas as well. Of course, with Next Star, it's always digital first now. So once again tonight, <laughs> you can follow along with our discussion by the social media hashtag Abbott Town Hall. And here we go. Okay, before we get to questions from the crowd, and I know that there are a whole lot of questions that you have for the governor tonight. We do want to start with El Paso, Governor, and I know that you do as well. And we thought it would be appropriate if we could hear from somebody in El Paso and their thoughts. Listen. Governor Abbott, one of the things uh, coming on the heels of what happened in El Paso is that even though we may have differing opinions on the Second Amendment, we need to find something that works for both sides so that we don't have another person driving 600 miles to a very safe place like El Paso and gunning down 22 people. Governor, you can hear in Jose's voice, the city of El Paso is still mourning. That's my hometown. What do you say? to people in El Paso tonight, Texans everywhere, about how you're going to keep us safe. Let me answer that, but I have something for you. Okay. I know that you're from El Paso. I have with me, I wear a bracelet now that says El Paso Strong. And the community last night and every night is so united, but I thought that you might like one of these also. I would. So Thank you. I brought one of these oh. El Paso Strong bracelets for you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you for being out there. Sure. I, I'm, I'm hoping that you saw just how resilient El Pasoans are. El Pasoans are unbelievable. The compassion they have, the unity they have, the, the support they have for each other. You know, this is the greatest travesty probably that's ever happened in El Paso. It is. But in, uh, yet last night was my third trip to El Paso since the shooting took place. But to, to see the way the people came together, to know what happened on the day of the shooting, there were people lined up, blocks, waiting to get in to donate blood. People came together and support each other. But people like Jose have real questions, questions that need to be answered. 
and I want Jose who asked that question, but importantly, I want everybody to know that we have to address head on the shooting that took place in El Paso and make sure that travesties like that never happen again in El Paso or any place in the entire state of Texas. One thing that he talked about was Second Amendment rights, but also what led someone to drive 600 miles over to El Paso to do this. And you don't have to wonder because the person who did it, the killer, wrote it in a manifesto. He said in that manifesto that the reason why he made this attack is because of racism, because of hate, because of his desire to eliminate people from the face of the earth. This is an enraged killer. So we need to get to the root of that. And the beginning of that process happened yesterday when for the first time in the history of the state of Texas, a governor has used constitutional authority to create a task force dealing with domestic terrorism. We need to call this what it is and approach it for what it is, root out racist domestic terrorism, whether it be in El Paso or any other part of the state of Texas, and make sure this never happens again. There's going to be multiple steps we take to achieve this goal. First is with this domestic terrorism task force that will be operating year-round, working on these challenges. In addition to that, I will be announcing next week the same process that we use in the aftermath of the shooting at the school in Santa Fe. We had three days of roundtables. Uh, we will have roundtables, or it may have another name to it, where we will be including all of the delegation of El Paso, as well as other leaders from across the state of Texas, where we will put every issue on the table. We will bring together the brightest minds to help us solve the issues that Jose was asking about, to make sure that we are going to be able to address head on what caused this deranged killer to go to El Paso to commit this killing and what we as a state can do. I want to remind everybody of this. We have two of your great state representatives here, one of your state senators here, and in the aftermath of the Santa Fe shooting, we, after those roundtables that we had, we worked for months to process those ideas. And when this session ended this past May, I signed more than 20 proposals into law to make Texas safer after the shooting that took place at Santa Fe High School. We will do the same for El Paso, Texas. Governor, you called on lawmakers to make those changes. I think everybody can agree. Something needs to change after El Paso. The legislature is not going to meet until 2021, unless you come in. Unless you come in and you say, let's have a special session to address domestic terrorism concerns. Are you willing to call for a special session? Well, remember this, and that is, we dealt this past session with, with two enormous catastrophes. One was the shooting, not just of what happened in Santa Fe, but also the shooting in Southern Springs. Mm -hmm. But separate from that, we also had uh, the massive catastrophe of Hurricane Harvey. And, and the way that Texans work is completely different from the way that things work in Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C., everybody runs to their corners and they start carping, and they get nothing done. Texas is different. Our goal is not to go to Austin, Texas and for people to fight with each other. Our goal is to make sure that we find strategies of laws that we can pass that will make Texas safer. My point is this. After the shooting in Santa Fe, after the shooting in Southern Springs, after the Hurricane Harvey, we didn't rush in mm -hmm. to have a special session. Legislators work full time on legislation. We will all work together on the best ideas and strategies and vet them the way they need to be vetted to make sure that we're going to come up with laws that will pass and work. But remember this, government doesn't require the legislature to be in session in order for it to work. There are so many levers that the governor has available to him that we're going to be able to begin executing right now for us to be able to make sure that El Paso and other communities are safer right now 
And so we are not hesitating whatsoever. It doesn't require a special session for Texas to act because we will act without a special session, but we will also be working between now and the next session to make sure we have the laws in place to keep El Paso safe and to keep Texas safe. Some governor after a deadly school shooting, some jump in and say we have to change gun laws right now. And so even the president, President Trump, has talked about being okay with red flag laws. Uh, even our Smith County Sheriff, Larry Smith, who's in the audience tonight, said he would be okay with that when we talked to him a couple of uh, weeks ago. But during the last session, you said no. Have you come around? Have you changed your mind about that at all? Well, a couple of things about this, and, and that is so everyone can understand what the playing field is in the state of Texas. We actually do have uh, a red flag law, the red flag law that exists already, and that is uh, whenever there is a conviction for domestic violence, that serves as a red flag uh, with regard to being able to get a gun. Separate from that, there is an additional, you could call it a red flag law, red flag law. It doesn't deal with guns per se, it deals with mental health, and that is if there's a mental health condition, it raises a red flag that law enforcement uh, can work on getting a person to the health care they need if they are a person who poses a danger to themselves or others. Something like this proved very effective just last month when there was a, a person who wanted to commit a mass murder in Lubbock, Texas, and he had the armaments to do so, but his grandmother talked him into going to a hospital, at which time law enforcement was able to get involved, and they were able to prevent a mass murder from taking place. Now, all that said, one thing that arises when people start talking about red flags is, well, would a red flag law have worked to prevent the shooting in El Paso? The answer is no. The reason is the shooter in El Paso had demonstrated no red flags at all that would have triggered any type of mechanism that would have prevented him from being able to get a gun in the first place. And, and so when you start talking about passing laws, it's important that you have laws that are going to be able to prevent the crimes that you're trying to prevent. And so this will be some of the ideas that will be discussed. But you raise another thing very important, and that is the federal government, as you pointed out, is going to be involved in addressing shootings because these shootings are taking place in, pla taking place in areas other than just Texas. And as a result, uh, you've heard the president talk about red flag laws as well as uh, background checks, and we'll see what the federal government does in the short run. In the long run, Texas will take a balanced and measured approach where we will work on getting guns out of the hands of deranged killers, but at the same time, respecting Second Amendment rights of law-abiding. Governor Abbott, as you know, there is a scandal happening in the city of Austin. The Texas Rangers are investigating the Speaker of the House, Dennis Bonin. He's been publicly accused of a backroom deal, offering press credentials, access, in exchange for campaign work against his rivals. Should that kind of conversation be happening in the Texas Capitol? Kennedy, the, what is taking place right now is the best thing that could happen, and that is getting the Texas Rangers involved. They are highly regarded, respected. They are the elite investigating agency here in the state of Texas. We need to get to the bottom of this and get to the bottom of it quickly. If, if they find out that anything bad happened, action needs to be taken. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if after their investigation they say nothing bad or illegal happened, we need to move on. But I don't know any of the facts of what happened. I do know this, and, and that is working with Speaker Bond in this past session, we were able to pass remarkable reforms to reduce property taxes, to uh, reform school finance, and so many other things. And so uh, he was a good partner mm -hmm. in working to make this a very successful session. Just one quick follow-up on that, because I know ethics are an important issue for you. You've not just called for ethics reform once in the legislature, but twice. Some people have called for him to resign. Do you agree with them? It's premature. We need to find out what the Rangers are going to find. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. Thank you. Governor, thank you. Lots of questions from the crowd here in Tyler tonight. We're going to get to those questions with Phil, who has uh, one of our members of the audience. A question from them? Yes, this is Wood County Sheriff Tom Castle with a question about immigration. Okay. Right, good evening, Governor Abbott. Welcome to East Texas. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, I'm a 23-year retired field operations supervisor for the United States Border Patrol. I spent my time on the Mexican border 
and on the Canadian border after 9-11. Illegal immigration to this country is a federal issue. Yet the uh, state of Texas is spending resources. We're sending the DPS troopers. We're sending down the uh, National Guard. But they lack the arrest authority to do anything with these. And I understand that uh, we're using them to backfill positions like for mechanics and for secretaries. But they're actually not boots on the ground when it comes to enforcement. So what I'm trying to do is, is there something that you can tell us about to, to make us feel better about the tax money going toward the border to make sure it's being spent appropriately and effectively? Absolutely. Uh, first, so people will know exactly what we've done. Uh, each session we make appropriations or spend money for a two-year period. We just finished a session where I signed a budget that appropriates $800 million where Texas is working to help and do our part to secure the border. And Sheriff and everybody else understand this. There's one reason and one reason only why we have to spend this money, and that's because the United States Congress is not doing its job to secure our border. If Congress would stop failing us, we could save this money. But let me be clear about how the money is being used. The money that we appropriated goes only to the Texas Department of Public Safety. It is adding 500 more Texas Department of Public Safety officers to make sure we are securing the border. And when I say that, understand this. Some are on the border themselves. You can, you're not allowed to get on your phone now, but you can later on get on your phone and find out what the Texas Department of Public Safety was doing earlier this summer and in the <coughs> spring as they were able to help prevent people coming across the border in Eagle Pass and some other locations. And so they are literally there on the border and the Department of Public Safety does have the authority to make arrests under certain conditions. Point one, point two about what the Department of Public Safety does and that is remember the people coming across the border aren't just people looking for a better place to live or looking for a place to work. There are drug cartels involved in this. There are gangs. There are human traffickers. And it's the job of the Department of Public Safety, if there's anybody who's uh, coming across the border committing crimes in the state of Texas, we want those people arrested and put behind bars, and the Department of Public Safety has the authority to make those arrests. Governor Abbott, if, if, Phil, let me, if I could just finish real quick, and that is, he asked about the National Guard. Understand why I deployed 1,000 National Guard. This happened in June. In June, in the first three weeks of June, those three weeks alone, there were 45,000 people who came across the border illegally. And get this fact, they came from 52 different countries. As governor, I cannot just stand back and let that happen and just wait on Congress to step up, which they would never do. So I deployed a thousand National Guard to the border to help out. And here's what they're doing and how they are adding a thousand new boots on the ground. When the Border Patrol makes an arrest or detention of someone, as, as you probably know, Sheriff, there's paperwork that has to be complied with. There's the movement, the transportation of them from one place to another. Whenever Border Patrol agents are engaging in those types of activities, they're not on the border where they need to be, working on making uh, the detentions and arrests they need to be making. And by the National Guard filling those roles, it basically adds a thousand more Border Patrol agents to do their job to help secure our border. Governor, just a quick follow-up on that. How do you measure success off of the National Guard troops there? Are there any specific metrics you're going to look to to say, yes, we're getting our money's worth or not? You know, it's, all, it's difficult to come up with a metric that works because uh, we're, w what would be a metric as to whether or not the Border Patrol mm -hmm. is effective and whether or not we should fund Border Patrol? Well, what would happen if we didn't fund Border Patrol? Mm -hmm. It would be open border season. That's what would happen. That's why it's necessary for us to fund Border Patrol. In fact, what Congress needs to do, Congress needs to better fund Border Patrol. That will help secure the border. But in, in the meantime, Texas will do everything we can to step up and do our part 
to secure the border. Understanding this last point, which is hugely important. In Texas, we fully embrace legal immigration. Our job is focused on preventing illegal immigration. Thank you, Governor. Another question from the crowd over here to the left, Governor, is Daniel Klecker. And Daniel is actually a student, incoming freshman student here at UT Tyler, correct? Yes, ma'am. Welcome. Congratulations. All right, so with the recent announcement of the retirement of U.S. Representative Kenny Merchant, that marks the fourth Texas GOP member of the United States Congress to announce their retirement within the past six months. What does this mean for the future of Texas politics, and does this represent a shift in the values and goals of the Texas GOP party? If so, where do you believe they're shifting to? Well, first, uh, congratulations to you. So uh, you're an incoming freshman here at the University of Texas, Tyler? Yes, sir. Congratulations to you. You study political science? Uh, yes, sir. There you go. <laughs> Do you want my job one day? <laughs> uh, listen, there are, retirement, there are retirements every year. It, it could be Congress. It could be Senate. It could be the Texas House or Texas Senate. Uh, he had been there, I don't know how many years, but there is a time for all of us to go. Believe it or not, there's going to be one day when I retire also. Hopefully not anytime soon. Uh, but there's, people can't stay in office forever. That's point one. But let me answer the other key part of your question, and that is, is there any big dynamic change going on in the state of Texas? No, the, the, the political ties of the state of Texas are not staying Texas. It is a red state. It is going to stay a red state after this next election. We passed an entire load of what I will call conservative legislation that was good for everybody in the state of Texas. Understand this. Uh, in addition to passing the property tax reform package that we did, uh, we also passed a balanced budget that satisfied all four constitutional limitations on spending while also using $5 billion to buy down your property tax rates on average by about 7% across the entire state of Texas. But also on top of that, we had a freedom agenda, an agenda uh, that ensured that we would free people from government overreach by passing laws like banning red light cameras. <laughs> By protecting free speech on college campuses like this, guaranteeing you the right to speak your conservative values here at UT Tyler. <laughs> By legalizing the ability of youngsters in Texas to have lemonade stands without having to get a permit from their city to be able to sell lemonade. Let me mention just one last one that's important because you are a part of it. We passed a proposition in this session that's going to be on the ballot this November where you can help drive a stake through the heart of Texas ever having an income tax. Vote yes for Proposition 4 and prohibit an income tax in Texas. Governor. And I promise we're going to get to property taxes coming up in just the next few mm -hmm. minutes here. But to touch on Daniel's point, when it comes to the GOP, one of your congressmen who retired, Will Hurd. Will Hurd, the only black Republican lawmaker in the House. And when he retired, he said it was the president's Republican Party that is just not reaching out enough to people of color. So my question, Governor, is does the president need to change his tone? if for anything, to secure the long-term health of the Republican Party? Along those lines, especially along, if you would, the racial lines, yes. one thing that the president talks about all the time, and, and that is his success in achieving the lowest unemployment rate ever for the black community, the lowest unemployment rate ever for the Hispanic community. Uh, more women employed, and I'm proud to tell you here in Texas, uh, Texas ranks number one in America for women entrepreneurs. And you mentioned, if you would, rhetoric. And what, what I find voters really look at 
is results. And if you look at pocketbook results and so many other results and getting rid of regulations and the kinds of judges that he's appointing, I think if people look at those types of results, and I tell you this, this is a very dangerous year for the Democrats for this reason. <laughs> the leaders they have running for president, they're advancing socialism. When you compare capitalism versus socialism, I tell you what, I think the election is going to look pretty good for the Republicans because I will tell you this. The United States of America has lifted more people out of poverty than any other economic system in the history of the world. America is going to rise and remain strong after this election. Governor, thank you. Our next question is from Jeffrey Adrich in Austin from where you live. Take a listen. Hello, Governor Abbott. With the population of Texas continuing to grow and our urban corridors becoming more and more dense, what are your plans and policies to include a forward-thinking transit Texas, one that might include high-speed rail? Let me ask you about that because every time I read about the Dallas Morning News, it's always, it'll help people who live in Dallas and Houston and Austin or whatever, but whenever that happens, a lot of people's personal land is being plowed up because of that, right? A lot of people sit again. People, people's land is being annexed. Right. Well, let me tell you two things about this. One is, uh, there are several perspectives to bringing this. The first thing I want to let you know uh, is that uh, Texas is adding more than $8 billion a year to build roads, and we're doing that without raising taxes, fees, tolls, or debt. So we're working on building roads. But the second is, People need to look at the future of transportation in a far different way because I think we will hit peak road probably in about a decade. Understand with the ride sharing that is coming and believe it or not, with flying vehicles that are coming, <laughs> there's going to be different ways that we commute and get around. I know a man who is, is building a parking garage in downtown Dallas, but he's building it in a way where 10 years from now, it will be able to be converted into apartments because they will no longer need that parking garage in downtown Dallas because of changes in the way that people commute. Leave it to the advancements of technology and ingenuity that is unparalleled in the United States of America to come up with different ways for people to commute and travel. That is going to be the answer. To, to Jeffrey's question. And also a follow-up here, Governor. Uh, here in East Texas, we're having trouble with Toll 49, uh, a new freeway expansion here, displacing families, farmland, that sort of thing. So what would you say to people who may be paying the price with the land they own? You know how sacred the land is for Texans. Right, right. What, what is your stance on that? Private <clears throat> property rights are paramount, and we must protect private property rights in Texas. All right, Bill? Governor, this is Eldon McCurley, who's from Smith County. Eldon, what's your question? Good afternoon, Governor. How are you doing? This, as a Smith County property owner, taxes are very important to me, paying them. This last legislative session, what did you and the other lawmakers do to lower our property taxes? Well, well thank you for the question. Uh, but I understand your pain. I want you to know that we've heard similar stories from people around the entire state of Texas that property taxes are making it unaffordable to live in a house or to rent a place to live or even for a business to stay open. And that's why we worked with your senator and your house members to make sure that we had transformative property tax reform. We did these three things. One, we used more than $5 billion dollars to reduce your property tax rates. On average across the state of Texas, that will be about a 7% reduction in the first year with an increased reduction in the second year. I read in the Tyler newspaper uh, that in your independent school district, it looks like in the first year, it will be about a 6.7% reduction in your property tax rate. Now, in addition to that, know this, because what I'm about to tell you is the, the biggest effort ever in the state of Texas to limit the growth of government. It involves limiting the ability 
of those taxing authorities to come back in behind our tax decrease <clears throat> and jack up those property taxes again. Mm -hmm. This is the greatest effort, effort ever in the history of Texas to limit government. What it does is it puts a limit on school districts. They cannot grow their property tax revenue more than 2.5%. Cities and counties cannot grow their property tax revenue more than 3.5%. As a result, even if your property values skyrocket, they will not be able to increase their property taxes. In fact, they will be required to decrease their property tax rates to stay within the property tax limits. Bottom line is this. You deserve to own your home as opposed to paying rent to mm -hmm. government, and we did more to effectuate that end than ever before in the history of the state. Good. Thank you. One quick follow-up on that, Governor. Uh, Senate Bill 2, as you mentioned, really it, it will slow the growth of property tax, save money in the future. There was another idea that you pushed for in the legislature that did not pass, a raise of the sales tax in order to buy down people's property taxes. And that would have done, uh, would have lowered much more uh, taxes than they are currently. Um, the legislature didn't go there with you. Are you going to bring that back next session or are you going to accept defeat on that? No, th this is a conversation people need to have because people need to understand what the conversation is. And, and that is, you want lower property taxes. Most everybody wants lower property taxes. The issue is, are we going to achieve lower property taxes incrementally, just a tiny bit year after year, or are we going to be able to meaningfully cut property taxes? My preferred goal would be to cut property taxes by 25%, by 50%, or maybe get rid of property taxes altogether. In order to achieve that, though, you have to have another revenue stream to pay for that. The one that most people have supported as an alternative is a consumption tax. If people are willing to do that, I'm for it. But listen, this has to be <coughs> something that people buy into. If people are against that, they can be assured of what we will do. We will work every single session to achieve greater property tax reduction. If I could, let me add one last thing that I omitted from my answer earlier. There's another component that went along with that property tax reduction, uh, and that is uh, we cut what's known as Robin Hood recapture by almost 50%, making sure that okay. the money you raise in property taxes from your school district stays in your schools, paying for the education of your students who live right here. So, Governor, just, just to clarify, yes, you'll bring the tax swap idea back next session? This, any strategy that will reduce property taxes will always be on the table. All right, Governor, thank you very much for that. So keeping it here in East Texas once again, we have an audience member that would be from Holly Lake, Lynn Stenica, right? Lynn, go ahead. Yes, but I'm from Hawkins, not. Oh, I'm sorry, I said Holly Lake. Yes, Thank you, because in today's world, the availability of robust Internet service divides Texans into haves and have-nots. For example, fiber optics was just laid to Holly Lake, giving them robust <coughs> Internet services, but not to us outliers. Decades ago, the government helped to pay to bring electricity to all Texans. And uh, would you support a similar plan to bring fast internet service to everyone? Uh, we, we passed some things like that uh, with your representatives. They're, they're nodding here right now. Uh, rural, we passed rural broadband funding uh, to make sure that all corners of the state of Texas will have e equal access to the internet. And this is hugely important because the way the world works today is if, if one group of people have access to the internet, and the other group of people have access to only hard documents like books and papers. It'll be a divided state and divided country. Everybody needs to be able to access the Internet to tap into all information sources. With what we passed out this session, and then especially combined with what the state is working on with Internet providers as we roll out 5G, which will be coming to a place near you very soon, it, it will completely change the world in which you live. Hope so. Count on it. <laughs> Governor, thank you. Now to fill with an audience member. Governor, we want to introduce you to Mason Combs. He's from Tyler Boy Scout Troop 356 and recently 
received his Eagle Scout Award. Well, yeah. And he's also studying to be a commercial pilot. Cool. Mason, what's your question? Thank you, Mr. Governor, for taking my question. So as a Boy Scout, the motto is be prepared, as you know. What experience in life best prepared you to be governor? governor? Hmm. Well, great question. Well, first, let me say congratulations on being an Eagle Scout. Thank you, sir. Uh, second, you know, maybe one thing that put me on the pathway was my experience as a scout. I was a member of Troop 201 in Longview, Texas, hmm. uh, which is the oldest troop in East Texas. And if, if I were to answer your question by looking at the past, retrospectively, I, I can see there, there was nothing where I had a vision forward saying, what do I need to do in order to be able, let's say, to be governor, to be successful? But looking back in the past, first thing was being a, a Boy Scout. And then you take each step along the way, being prepared always for what may come. But there's some other events in life. For me, I had a very transformative event, the one that left me in the wheelchair. And overcoming a challenge of an accident that breaks your life in half, and then realizing that even though you have that accident, you can still move on. And it was after the accident that put me in the wheelchair that I went on to become a Supreme Court Justice, the longest serving Attorney General, and now Governor of the great state of Texas, showing that anybody can achieve anything in this great state. But so putting all that together and, and then thinking precisely about your question, you know, one thing that it takes more than anything else is a passion. Being born in Texas, being raised in Texas, living in almost every part of our entire state, I have a passion for this state, a passion for its people, a passion for the true exceptionalism that Texas has. I truly believe in my heart, Texas is the best state in the entire United States of America, and I wake up every single day to keep it that way. Innovation from the crowd here in here. Tyler. <laughs> we have questions from all over the great state of Texas. If you can direct your attention to the monitor, Governor, right here. We have a question from Lamont. Hello, Governor Abbott. My name is Lamont Darden, resident of Allen, Texas. I have a question for you relative to mental health in the black community. The question is Are there programs in place to support mental health? If not, what are your plans to create these programs to make the community aware that they exist? Thank you. It's a well, good point, Governor. It is a good point, and I'm, I'm glad Lamont asked it because people need to know, and they need to know what we did this session because know this, mental health is always a big issue. It's always an issue that Texas has been committed to addressing, but we've never addressed it as profoundly as we just did in this past session. And there were several catalysts behind it. One lead catalyst was the aftermath of the shooting at Santa Fe. I told you earlier that what we did after the shooting in Santa Fe, we had these roundtables for, for three days that led to all these different proposals. In talking to experts from inside Texas, from outside Texas, from law enforcement, from educators, et cetera, there was one common theme, especially among those who had dealt with shootings in the past, including someone who served in the Secret Service who studied the Columbine shooting and that is mental health was always an issue that needed to be addressed. So we went into this session knowing that one thing we needed to address, especially with regarding the shooting base issue, was to do a better job with the mental health. But then we built upon that, and we passed uh, what's called a mental health care consortium that brings together all of our universities in the state of Texas, having them work together to address the needs that Lamont was talking about. We know that we as a state can and we must do a better job of addressing the mental health needs. So part of it is doing that study, but part of it is making more resources available to those who need it and informing people about how they need it. 
or, or how we provide it. And so I'm glad Lamont asked the question and just know that we provided a record amount of funding to address mental health needs in the state of Texas this past session. Governor, thank you for that. We also have a question to the left. This is Quant Alon Henry with a, a question about second chances. Welcome. Good evening, Governor Abbott. As you know, the state of Texas is a leader, never a follower. And I want to know what can Texas do to help provide incentives to companies to help the formerly incarcerated so they will be able to be hired when they are released, specifically nonviolent offenders. What are we doing to lead the country in making sure those people who have already paid their debt to society will become the productive citizens they need to be to help make this country the best that it can be? Sure. Thank you very much for the question. You're welcome. L l we, as you might imagine, Texas should be the leader, and in fact, we are the leader in this sector. Uh, you may recall a couple of weeks ago, the, the president signed what I think was categorized as the second chances law. What you may not know is the special advisor that he brought in that was the architect of that second chances law, because she was also the architect of the second chances law that we passed in the state of Texas. Her name is Brooke Rollins, who used to work at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, now works in the White House. But Texas has already passed uh, multiple laws where we are the national leader in making sure that people do have second chances. Uh, for this reason, we know that there are people who may commit crimes that pay their debt, but we also know that many, if not most of them, they pose no future danger to society. We don't want to let them out of jail and just let them wither on the vine or do nothing. We want to help promote them to being productive citizens in the great state of Texas. And so uh, we have uh, signed multiple laws such as uh, the, the uh, check the box law and other laws to, to make sure that uh, employees are gonna have a chance to apply for a job. I'm sorry, it's ban the box law, not check the box, ban the box law, uh, to make sure that people are gonna have that second chance to get a job. But separate from that, you need to know what the private sector is doing because it's very robust. Uh, there's uh, the, the owner of the Omni Hotels, his name is Bob Rowling, is one of the leaders in this and working with the private sector across the entire state of Texas, where he focuses on employing those who have been incarcerated in the past, giving them ec economic opportunity to get a job and put them on the pathway uh, to being productive citizens in our state. We want every man and woman in this state to have their own chance at the unique brand of economic prosperity that Texas offers. It doesn't matter if you have an arrest record, we want you to have a job. Thank you, Governor. <laughs> Governor, turning now to education, our next question is from a viewer in Lubbock. Have a listen, sir. What is the state doing about education and teachers' raises? Thank you. What do you think about her question? Okay, it looks like her name was Camille Camille in, yep. in Lubbock, Texas. Yep. <laughs> uh, we, we had an enormous session uh, that we just finished uh, that addresses teachers and te uh, teacher pay raises as well as improving education in this state. Uh, one thing that we know uh, is that a key component of our democracy is our educators. We count first on the, the members of the United States military to fight for our freedom but it's our teachers who are responsible for perpetuating our freedom through our democracy by educating our kids, and we thank every teacher who has ever served. My wife is one of them, by the way. One way we do that is by paying them better so we can both recruit and retain the very best teachers. And we provided teacher pay raises across the entire state of Texas this session. But very importantly, are the additional funds that we provided for education because our goal is to do more than just throw money at education. We want to invest in strategies that are going to work. So we invested in uh, better training for educators of, of early education to make sure that all of our students are gonna be able to read at grade level by the time they finish the third grade, knowing that that puts them on the pathway to future uh, academic success. Then also we invested money for high school 
for career and college readiness as well as military readiness, knowing that we want our students when they leave high school to go on to that next step, whether it be a job or college or the United States military, we want Texans to be prepared. And so we're doing more than just providing money. We're investing in results to make sure that the education for our children is gonna be better in the future. So thank you, Camille. Mm -hmm. So, Governor, another question for me. So tonight I'm going to be taking care of the, the home folks here. In Texas, we have all sorts of weather phenomenon, tornadoes, we have snow, we have hurricanes, everything else. And a couple of months ago, back in April, in Alto, along with San Augustine, as well as uh, the city of Canton, a tornado outbreak, but the worst of which was in Alto. So pretty much everyone jumped in to help quickly. We appreciate that. The state came down. The alphabet agencies took a look. FEMA shows up, but the property values are so low, they did not meet the federal guidelines to get help. Now, you were kind enough to sign a declaration of disaster. We appreciate that, but still people are hurting down there, and the progress has been so slow. How can you help? Mm -hmm. There are a couple of things. One is, uh, so everybody can understand how all this FEMA process works. It's, te it's technical. It, it, it's te <laughs> I, can do it, I can do it in one sentence, and that is, in order to qualify for FEMA funding, you have to meet a certain dollar threshold of the amount of damages that have occurred. And as you pointed out, in Alto, uh, the sufficient level of dollar damages was not met in order for FEMA to be triggered. I was able, as you pointed out, uh, to declare a state disaster. What that does, it, it triggers what's called the Texas Division of Emergency Management. And what we did this session is uh, we uh, redesigned the Texas Division of Emergency Management to make them a whole lot more responsive. Uh, and we have a, a former fire chief, Chief Kidd, uh, who runs this. And uh, he is very responsive, uh, and he is probably hearing this right now. Chief Kidd, you need to contact the people in Alto, Texas, and get on top of that and address whatever issue they may have to get fixed. I bet he will respond. So t t tell me who he should contact. Several folks the, the said that mayor the, or the county judge. County judge. Else. Contact the county. Nim Kidd. Contact <laughs> the county judge. And He's Alto. been called out. That's, that's, the way, that's the way we get business done in the state of Texas. <laughs> mark my words. Mark my words. Nim Kidd will probably have contacted that county judge before this TV show is over. And go. that's good because they need to the help. Thank you very much. And a different way of calling out. Um, as a parent, I look forward to my kid bringing home the report cards, right? Because I get to figure out exactly where they are. The TEA, the state, came out with its list of grades, grading every single school district. And here in Tyler, you're doing really good. You got a B, which is excellent. But when we take a look deeper at the report from the state governor, we find out that it's only the white students who are meeting the goals. It's the black students, the Hispanic students, the Asian students, the students of colors who are not meeting the goal statewide. So my question to you, statewide, what are we going to do to close that gap? Right. We passed laws this session that close that gap in two fundamental ways. Understand this. This is hugely important. There's a clear demonstration that your academic success is not hinged to either your race or your zip code. And it's proven by the Dallas Independent School District. We modeled what we did in the state of Texas based upon the success they achieved in the Dallas Independent School District. There was uh, an elementary school that I visited uh, that before these changes were made, it was like ranked uh, something like 132nd in the Dallas Independent School District. After just a couple of years of changes where you put uh, the best teachers, pay them more, and put them in the most challenging classrooms success was achieved, they went from 132nd to being second best in all of the Dallas Independent School District. Similar changes occurred throughout Dallas, and these were either primarily of or solely of racial minority, high poverty students. So it doesn't matter your income level, your race level, or your zip code, we know through strategies all students can succeed. And when I was talking earlier, about funding strategies uh, through the funding we provided for school finance it was exactly those types of strategies so students will be able to achieve successfully regardless of what their background is. Thank you, Governor, for that. I got lots of questions. Another round of applause for that answer. It's important. Another question that we have has to do with voter registration from the crowd here in Tyler. 
Happy anniversary, Governor Greg. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My name is Donna Goodwin. Since 1971, when the 18 year olds got the vote, and you know how long ago that was, <laughs> I have worked and had the best blessing of my life to be an election official seasonally and uh, work in so many different times, especially your election. <laughs> um, we certainly do appreciate the paper trail that your administration has implemented for the ballot. Part of our oath as an election official every time is to guard the purity of the election. I love taking that up. I'd like to ask you please to, to hear what y'all would like to continue to do to especially empower the Secretary of State to have all the tools that they need to be certain that the registration process is guarded and then also transfer more empowerment to the local administration, administrators that, to be able to see if and when something's going on at a polling place that they can then be able to take that jurisdiction. Sure. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for your service and everything that you've done. We appreciate that very much. We, we need people like you and Bob. I mean, this, this is the people's government, and it takes people like you to make sure that it run, runs right. And I would say that's especially true in the election process. Understand this, as I know you know, and that is I, I, I've been very aggressive in making sure uh, that our elections uh, have high integrity. Uh, formerly, I was uh, the, the Attorney General of the State of Texas, and as of that time, I brought more legal actions uh, about illegal voting in the state of Texas than any other Attorney General before. I know that cheating does occur. It must stop. We must have valid elections in the state of Texas, and we will continue prosecuting voter fraud whenever and wherever it occurs. Now, that said, we also need to make sure that our rolls, uh, our, our voter registration rolls are valid. Understand this, listen, there, there, there are people on the voter registration rolls who pass away every year. There are people who move out of the state every year. And it's a fact that there are people who are here without authority who are on the rolls. We need to make sure only those who are legally authorized are eligible to, eligible to vote, while at the same time encouraging everybody who is eligible to vote to go vote. And I think working together on things like that, but also voter ballot box <coughs> security measures like what you're talking about, all of these are needed. Listen, it's a complex process that involves a lot of moving parts that requires a lot of people to be involved. We're very grateful for your involvement. I'm grateful for you. God bless you. You too, thanks. Thank you. Governor, I know it's a special night and I wish we can keep the conversation going, but quickly, if you can just please let us know how special night this is for you and Cecilia. 38 years. Congratulations right. of being well, married. Well, thank you. There's. A picture of my wife, she's watching. I want to say, hi, honey, love you. Thank you for 38 fabulous years. This may be our 38th anniversary, but it still seems like our very first anniversary. Oh. Real quickly, if I could, she's meant so much to me. I, I... Thank you, Governor. Congratulations. She shows unity and support and love for everybody in this state. She's a jewel. Thank you, Cecilia.